my my biggest um, my biggest fear is that you wouldn't believe me and that people wouldn't believe me. Just so crazy to me that th there was such a desperation that you had to literally change your identity. But that was your goal, is you wanted to cure. How did you talk to your kids about me? So growing up, could you have ever imagined that we would be sitting right here doing this video? No. Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. No, this, this is a video I've been wanting to do with you for a while, and we've talked about it. And I think we've both been on our own journey, as many of you guys know. It's been a process, I think, for both of us of, I would call, maybe awakening or finding yourself. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think there's different parts of your life. You know, there's life when we're younger, there's life before marriage, after marriage, before kids, after kids. But this has been a really unique couple years just to see how much we've just, our paradigm in life has shifted in such a drastic way. And you recently did a couple of videos talking about your faith expansion, your different challenges you've gone through as a father of of quintuplets and two boys. Um, and Skylar just went live to talk about his, his journey, and that's something I never could do. <laughs> that would have made me so nervous. Yeah, to me, it's like I didn't want to overthink it. And obviously, I've been thinking about stuff like this a lot over the last few years. But yeah, I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to open up <laughs> and just kind of share some of my feelings and some of my experiences in hopes that it's something that you know can help other people. I think a lot of people are going through pretty big transitions in their lives right now. We were both raised, as many of you know, um, Mormon or members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And Amanda and I had made a video about our, our faith transition. And Skylar recently did as well on uh, his channel, Five to Love. So one of the reasons we are doing this video, we've had a lot of questions. And I think for the most part, a lot of the questions are the same on both of our channels with, yeah. with some crossover. Yeah, definitely a lot of questions. It's been funny because we've sent texts back and forth and I'll say, hey, are you getting these questions? And Shay will send me four of the exact same questions. So it's kind of cool that we can sit down together and, and talk about some of these things. Yeah, so what I did is I kind of curated some questions from you guys so that hopefully we'll fill you in on some of the things you've been wondering about. So the first question, and this is probably the hardest question for you to answer is, why do we have the same name? Yeah, so this is one that we probably should have mom on to help, but this is Shay Scott. I'm Skylar Shay Scott. So Shay has my middle name. I will note that I had it first, but we come from a large family, 10 kids, and all of the names are S names. And so my mom kept that going. I was going to be the baby. And then she decided to have one more child, had Shay. But she always loved the name Shay. So she gave me Shay as the middle name. When Shay was born, and this is as the legend goes, it was still her favorite name. So she gave you my middle name. And she didn't ask me. I don't ever remember giving consent, but I, I, I'm cool with it. Uh, and thankfully, the name works for both boys and girls. Yeah. Mostly, mostly girls, but sorry, you, know, you have a girl name. I'm Skylar. So, I mean, even Skylar is a, a universal one. So, but that's kind of cool. You don't have to, you don't have to tweak it. I have all. to change, but that's the only thing. Yeah. Maybe that was a little inspirational on my mom's part. I think more than anything, she just had to stick with the S names because yeah. she, she couldn't have all of these S names and then just name you Chuck. So, <laughs> and you'd have to change it to, what's the feminine name of Chuck? I don't I, know. I was, Chuckina. Yeah. Chuck. Chuckina. Chuck <laughs> So if you were to summarize it, how would you describe what our childhood was like being raised here? You know, it, growing up in the community we grew up in was actually pretty picturesque in, in a lot of ways. We're in an area where there was tons of kids. We were in the neighborhood where someone's knocking on the door like every five minutes to play. Growing up, I, I remember on our, our street, there was like a couple neighbor girls that ended up being my best friends. So I hung out with girls a lot, but there was tons of guys to hang out with. Is this your coming out video? Yeah, it is. I'm coming out as a Tom girl. So there we go. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I think I hung out with all the same girls you did. Um, growing yeah. out, there was there was three girls on our street that I don't think I had actually one guy friend until like much later in elementary. And um, yeah, but no, I mean, for the most part, when I think of my childhood, I would describe it as happy. Although very challenging at the same time, obviously, because of, of uh, my experience of growing up uh, being transgender. An interesting thing, like when I look back and reminisce growing up, I can truly say I had no idea of any of the underlying feelings you were going through at all. Um, when I think of Shay, I just remember, um, 
you know, the, the, the little brother, the tag along. Um, I remember if you got Skittles, you wouldn't share with me. Um, I remember well, his, it was the rainbow. Why would it, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The rainbow, you just hoarded that rainbow, <laughs> but definitely I, you were just, you were just my little brother, Shay. But yeah, all in all, um, th there was never any indication that, that you were transgender or that, that you, you know, had that, that inner struggle going on. Yeah, honestly, and it wasn't until much later in life that I found out that the experience I was having was gender dysphoria. And um, it was something that I didn't really talk to mom and dad about until I, I was older, you know, like I think nine or 10. But yeah, you know, one thing that's really unique, I think, about where we were raised is there was a lot of conformity. There was a lot of sameness. I would describe it as a suppression of being anything different than identity, the, yeah. a, a suppression of identity. I, I definitely feel that because it, it's, you know, people knew what was expected of them. You're going to dress this way. You know, this is how we talk. And if someone showed up with shorts that were too short or were showing part of their shoulder or heaven forbid, you put like a, a pink stripe in your hair or something like that. The interesting thing is all these things I'm talking about too, were more on the women. Like the women had like the strictest mm -hmm. dress code, but in general, in so many ways, being an individual or standing out wasn't something that was encouraged. Yeah, it was something that I think for a lot of us, if you didn't fit that ideal mold, it would often lead to feeling feelings of shame. Yeah. And, you know, I, th I think in my life as, as something that's been in this incredible journey that has had very happy moments, and I don't want to dismiss that, but it's so hard to now at this phase of my life to unpack a lot of this underlining depression that I, I was facing because of, of trauma and shame. It was like I was raised with a pack of lions when I wanted to be with the geese. The geese. You wanted to be. <laughs> that a good animal? <laughs> you wanted to be the golden goose. I wanted um, to be the golden goose. <laughs> and, but yeah, you're, and it's not even talking about something that's like superficial. I mean, a lot of people would probably say, no, we had individuality. But what you're talking about is a core part of who you are. And when a core part of who you are has no place in the mold that's presented or in the community, I, I can't imagine how hard that would be. And, and to wrestle with that thinking, what's, what's wrong? I mean, that's ultimately why you arrive at shame when you, when, when you're told to conform a certain way and you think, well, I'm the only one that feels this way. And, and what's, and I, I, I know talking to you when we first talked, that was one of the things you said was the toughest is you really felt you were completely alone. This experience was uniquely only Shay, and to talk about it would be um, alarming. Yeah, it'd be it'd be the end of of me. Like it, it would it would re it would reveal something about me that's just so so wrong and so bad. But you know, it's it's funny you say that because a lot of times people don't obviously know what it's like to be transgender, but there is a commonality that I, where I think people can understand my experience, and and that is the common experience of feeling shame. Mm -hmm. And and I know for you, you know, you talked about in your previous video how feeling shame about a a part of who you are or something you have done um, that doesn't easily go away. And, yeah. And that was my shame. That was my story. But you can relate to that in a different way. Definitely. And I think that shame, you know, when you're in a really tight Orthodox community, it's maybe even more even more exacerbated. However, it really is part of the the human experience that we come here. We're just us. We're just observing life. We're just those, those beautiful three-year-old, four-year-old kids just embracing everything, curious about everything. But as time goes on, we all of a sudden get, okay, well, this is what you're supposed to be. And, and these are your boundaries. And, and this is who you are. And this is who God wants you to be. And when all of those things come, you start to lose a, a, a bit of that magic or you start to forget it. I don't think we ever lose it, but you start to forget um, your true essence when you have so many things laid out saying, this is how it's got to be. Mm -hmm. This is how you need to be. Especially when you believe your true essence is bad, you know, and yeah. that's, that's something that it's so crippling. It's so, mm -hmm. it's so hard. So another common question that I get is how did you react to my coming out? I still vividly remember when you opened up to me. Uh, about gender dysphoria, opened up about being transgender. Uh, we were sitting in a car and, and when you told me, I'm a theater arts major, and so I'd already had some cognitive dissonance with the way that our community handled um, people in the LGBTQ plus community. I remember spending time with these friends, being in shows and stuff with them, and thinking, this person is not bad or dark. Or, or In fact, 
they have so much light and a lot of love. And in a lot of ways, I felt like we're more Christ-like than a lot of other people that I knew. I get that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so like, like it wasn't like something like that I'd never looked at or experienced, but when it was my own sibling and I had no idea, I think that's what hit me first. First and foremost is when you opened up and, and I remember we both cried. I, I was thinking I had no idea. I had no idea that from the time you were three, you, you had pain and, and didn't know how to express yourself. And also, you know, being raised in the community we were and being, you know, devout. We, our parents were very devout and very focused on, you know, following the prophet because they believed with all their hearts. That's how we could be a family forever. And that's, that was their chief goal. But when you and I sat in that car, we both knew how the community looked at this and what it meant. Uh, there was a period of time that, that if someone opened up being queer, just opening up about it was enough to lose their membership in the church. And in our minds and in my mind at that time, you know, I, I was, I was still a devout Mormon that meant excommunication in God's kingdom. And so the cognitive dissonance was through the roof, but more than anything, it was maybe one of the first times that I had to sit and think, is, is this real? What I was raised in, what I believed my whole life, is this really it? Because I grew up with you. I knew you were a good person. So it was definitely a, a, a moment that one of the first times that I allowed myself to actually just ask an honest question and, and just to sit with it. And it's, it's not a change that happened overnight. I sat with that for a while, as you know. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you're emotional. <laughs> um, Yeah, it was something that was really hard for me because it was, um, I was at a point in my life where I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. And so for me, it was like this feeling of, this is who I am, send me to hell. And I, I didn't have a thing left. So so that that phase of my life of of um facing my loved ones was probably the most horrifying thing I could think of ever doing was uh to to open up about this and we grew up together and so my my biggest um my biggest fear is that you wouldn't believe me and that people wouldn't believe me and you know that's something I've struggled with for a long time and every once in a while, we'll get comments from people telling me who I am, and, and, and it, it triggers that 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 child inside sometimes, because um, I, I knew who I was before before they did, right? And I I was transgender before I knew what the word transgender was, you know. So when people talk about this, like it's just some some fad it's or stage you're going through yeah or... it, it's it's really it's it, it it triggers a part of me and that's something i remember you talking about is what 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 would my grandma think or what, what how are people going to react to this um yeah it, it was something that, uh it was it was a pivotal moment and it was it was my free fall it was my surrender it's interesting amanda and i were listening to uh Brene brown with with a guest she had on and they were talking about the lyrics of a song that said um, if you're lucky, you get to die many times before you die. And that would have had a different meaning to me prior to this. But for me, this this was my death that I needed to experience so that I could awaken. Yeah. So I could wake up from this dream that I was having of um, of just not really being allowed to be me. And another major shift that happened to me, in addition to just questioning, gosh, is this really real? If Shay is who she is, that means she can't live with God again. I just, I, and, and I knew who you were. I grew up with you and I thought there's no, there's no way. But in, in addition to that, it made me look inward and think, where am I cheating myself? Where am I just accepting the identity that was given to me rather than listening to, to, to my own intuition and, and being who I am and seeing how courageous it was for you in, in society to say, you know, I'm a trans woman. And, and to do that, it's almost like it gave me permission to say, you know what, Skylar, you're going to be exactly who you are. And it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. And in the end, all that really matters is that we're, we're true to who we are. 
and and that that's that's the only real truth that we could ever find peace and happiness in yeah and it's been interesting because i feel like that's where i found god you know it's just being true to who i am a uh, question for you seeing the courage that it took just for you to show up as shay what things have helped you to be able to live true to yourself okay so i think this is something i haven't actually talked about publicly yet but one of the the biggest things that really helped me to let go was actually psilocybin and um we, we both share a friend that owns a ketamine clinic and um, had used uh, plant medicine as a way for his healing and it wasn't until he shared his experience with me being a physician that i finally said you know maybe this is something i should try and for those of you guys that don't know, psilocybin is commonly used now for therapy to help people work through PTSD and trauma and just uh, move through some really hard stuff. It really was like it's the mushrooms, the magic mushrooms. That's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which <laughs> I had a totally different like feeling of what that was yeah. prior to that. It really feels like 10 years of therapy and, and one session of this. And so it was probably... Um, one of the most transformative experiences I've ever had. It's like I lived in this small 10 by 10 room in my whole life and I built these walls around me, this idea of who I am and to have that completely shatter and be obliterated over the course of three, three to four hours in, in my session it just gave me an awakening. What was your intention when you initially took plant medicine, took psilocybin? Interestingly enough, I was actually taking it to cure my gender dysphoria because that's how i reframed it back then is that i'm not transgender i have gender dysphoria which is so crazy to me that th there was such a desperation that you had to literally change your identity to somehow you know somehow feel better but that was your goal is you wanted to cure i want to be killed right yeah. i want to be cured and just be a man yeah yeah <laughs> exactly so for me um what it did is it did the opposite in the sense that i stopped viewing my problem as a problem it became so insignificant and i just realized in the same way that i was left-handed and no one cared i'm also transgender you know and i think people get so caught up in what that means and, and I, at the end of the day it's just it's just a descriptor to explain how i feel most authentically showing up in the world it's almost like people make it their problem you know, that, that hey, I, I, I want to feel more comfortable. And so I need you to be this, even though you're Shay. Yeah. 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 I think it also was so eye opening in the sense that this concept of who Shay is was something that I just made up. Like, like even all the pain I felt of, you know, maybe it's my trauma around religion and, and all these things that I felt were happening to me in that moment, I realized that there were just an experience. And I was telling the story the whole time. I was both the producer, the director, and the character and the writer all simultaneously. Only I would forget and only think that I was just the character. And I realized that things weren't happening to me. They were actually happening for me and that I was actually creating them. You're the creator of all of it. Yeah. So I too took psilocybin <laughs> and in a nutshell, the, the when I was on the medicine, it was a very similar experience. It was a moment of which I felt like I could step out of everything that had ever been created around me, all of these walls, step out of my mind and, and not even out, step into, step into my heart and realize that this is me and I'm pure, I'm strong, I'm beautiful, I'm worthy. And just, just feel that love and that connection to myself and, and also everyone and everything. The connection feeling you have is, is so profound, but more I could recognize that there was things in my mind that I had lived by and identified by that weren't me. And, and someone else put them in there. And, and if they weren't me, then it wasn't true. It wasn't real unless it originated from here. So it is profound. And I agree with you. I've always said it was like 30 years of therapy in three hours. Yeah, I agree that this concept of believing we're broken suddenly becomes like silly flipped on its back yeah. to like, how could I be broken yeah. I'm whole only I forget that I'm not yeah and that realization was just so profound like for me just just to go this is who I am 
yeah, and all in all, when I look at my experience, plant medicine didn't, it didn't solve anything as much as it just showed me. It just showed me like where, where I really, who I really was and or just that, that beautiful space. And, and then it gave me the opportunity to work to find that in my life. Yeah, I always tell people, you don't go into a session to, to be fixed. You go into a session, just be reminded that yeah. there's, nef- there's nothing wrong with you. And, and that it's a reminder. It's just okay. Yeah. You're not going anywhere. Like there's nothing to become. You're already all that. You only forget that you're not. So I also just want to add, um, in addition to, of course, psilocybin helping me, um, was having a support system, having you, uh, someone who I've known my whole life there to support me was huge. Uh, having other siblings as well. Um, in fact, many of our siblings, um, you know, being in a big family have, have for the majority have been pretty supportive. But then also Amanda, like Amanda has been incredible. My concerns of coming out to Amanda were that it was going to be over, you know, and in the interim, remember, I didn't necessarily tell her from like, I need to change something, but it was just like, it was me calling out for help. And she was the first one there to grab me and say, Hey, it's okay. You know, and having Amanda is amazing. As you guys know, Amanda is every bit as amazing you see on camera. So. Yes. And I, I remember as you started to transition, people would ask me, are you worried about Shay? And I remember saying, no, uh, Shay's getting in touch with who she is. And, and more than that, Shay has Amanda. And I knew that like, no matter what, that the relationship you have, you're there for each other, no matter what. All right. By far the most frequent number one question we get more than anything. And I know you get it as well. Did you leave your faith because of me? coming out? I would say yes and no. It really was the springboard that let me just embrace myself and go, okay, if Shay can be Shay, who's Skylar? And that w- that began the process of me looking within, deciding how I really felt about things, how Skylar feels about things. How does Skylar feel about his friends that are gay or queer or his trans sister? And having that freedom just an opening up the possibilities gave me the the oomph or like I say a springboard to then go through and do the very hard work of deconstruction. And it wasn't an easy process. It wasn't a, a flip of a switch, but it was enough to get me to where I could look at myself and decide how I felt. So a question for you, when you open up to me, did you ever think that I would leave the church? No, no way. Never. No one did. No, yeah. no. And, and, and just to add to that, I don't find any enjoyment of, of anyone leaving their faith. That's not my, my intention at all. I would just say to try to understand from my perspective, my faith was no longer serving me as a connection with God. It was actually getting in the way. It was blocking the light of me connecting with the divine. And so if, if someone else's faith serves them and that's how they connect with, with God, then I'm, I'm sincerely happy for them. So I've definitely even found, and this has been something that wasn't my paradigm at all. I always believed that God was out here and wanted me to conform in this way, but truly connecting with me was connecting with God. They're synonymous. Connecting with ourselves is connecting with the divine and, and, and understanding who we really are. You know, and one of the things I, I want to say as well is that There's a lot of valuable things that I'm grateful for as a result of being raised a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I said that, so don't get mad at me in the comments. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and for me, I feel like the church gave me the tools of how to connect with God. And I feel like stepping away from it gave me the experience of meeting the divine. And she was beautiful. Yeah, I agree. Looking back, I wouldn't change anything about my life. To me, Mormonism, it was almost like it was a cocoon that I'd built around myself and I learned so much from it. And when I got out, it was just this beautiful realization that love was so much bigger than I'd ever imagined. Yeah. And that phrase that we often hear that God is love, it has such a a bigger meaning to you once you've been down this, this path. Yeah. And honestly, I wouldn't mind going and attending a meeting with you. We should do that. Yeah. 
I would go. At the end of the day, the, this community, the Mormon community will always be a part of who we are. It'll always be a part of my heart. And I don't feel in any way that I've graduated from anything or that I've gone up a level from, from the people we grew up with. I just look at things different. And again, like you said, when it comes to my faith, when it comes to what I believe, it just lands there that God is love and love, love is my religion. Yeah, I love how the theologian Richard Rohr, he said that certainty is dogma. That is the part that doesn't resonate with me anymore. But just focusing on the love, the experience with the divine that goes beyond language um, is, is where re religion is at its best for me. And that's where I want, want to be. And I know people can experience that both within organized religion and outside of, of organized religion. So another question I, I have seen a few times is how did you talk to your kids about me? You know, what's so interesting is when you're talking to kids, how they're already so open and come from a space of love anyway. So when I said, this is my sister, this is Aunt Shay, it instantly didn't mean th th there was no negative connotation. There was no dogma. They just thought, oh, okay, this is Aunt Shay. And Aunt, Aunt Amanda. So when Aunt Shay and Aunt, Aunt Amanda come over, they, they've never had any reservation or it's, you know, it's interesting because I think a lot of people, I've had comments saying, you know, is, are Shay's kids okay with this? And I'm like, Shay's kids, Shay's family are, are more behind Shay than anything. In fact, I even had one comment where someone's like, hey, that's, that's not fair that Shay should con conform and, and, and be this role. And I even look at that and think, how could that be? How could me being disingenuine to myself give any service to my kids? Because my kids, and I have quintuplets, I have five kids in real time that I can pair them to each other at the same age because they are the same age. And I love, I love that each one of them is different. And I would never go to any of them and say, look, I love you guys so much. I need you to be exactly like me or exactly like your sister, exactly this way. I celebrate more than anything, how they're uniquely divinely Logan, Lily, they're just themselves. And I love that. And so I've, I've, that's one thing I'm really proud of, of just you and your family. I think it shows that more than anything, being true to ourselves what greater gift could we give our kids than us? Yeah, and we've talked a little bit about this with our own kids on a video we created uh, about how our kids responded to my transition. But it's funny, even then, when we explain to them how our kids are fine with it, some people, and especially it seems like the older generation, have a hard time believing that our kids aren't being confused. And you know, to that, I would just say, it's not true. They're not being confused. They come into this world full of love and they're only taught to hate. Definitely. Fear is definitely something that's learned. It's something that adults teach to children. Kids are just open and loving. And the funniest thing about this, knowing you more than anything, you haven't changed. Shay has not changed. You're just showing up and same person. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we still make movies together. I just play yeah. a different character now. That's right. That's right. You slay it too. You slay it in our skits. Slay. More of the, I've had a lot of comments saying they want more Shay and Skyler's kids. So we'll see what we can do. Okay, that went a lot longer than I thought. And hopefully that was really enjoyable for you guys. I hope um, you're still here. Yeah. Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason, making a video like this has been really hard and vulnerable for me. Just because anytime I'm digging into my past, it's like I have to kind of bring up some of those feelings. And truthfully, I, I just kind of want to move on and just live my life and be me. And I'm sure you feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. And go get it. Go forth and slay. Amen. Amen. Okay, you can turn.